Hello everyone and welcome to Chemical Conversations. My name is Muhammad Fadil and I'm the SVP Strategy and Business Development at Argus. This is a special episode brought to you by Argus Media, a leading independent provider of energy and commodity pricing information. Today, we discuss the latest price trends on BioNafta and implications on the petrochemical markets. And I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues, Sarah Ray, VP Olefins, and Julia Squadron, Associate Editor, Biofuels. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Hi. Hi, Fadol. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Fadil. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Wonderful. Uh, Julia, let's start straight with you. Um, just get your thoughts. What BioNafta prizes does Argus offer and who's uh, interested in them? Yeah, so um, at Argus, we have been pricing BioNafta since early uh, 2022 as part of our daily coverage of the biofuels market. Um, I think it's worth noting we have two separate BioNafta prices. One is European focused and one is Asian focused. So we have a FOB ARA range price for BioNafta produced from used cooking oil. And also we have a CFR Northeast Asia BioNafta price. This price, the BioNafta coverage expands um, our uh, hydro-treated biofuels coverage. So we had previously launched prices for hydro-treated vegetable oil or HVO, also called renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel, and soon complete our, our suite of hydro-treated products by launching a biopropane price assessment later this year. The reason we have focused on the European and the Asian market because we, we, have, we have seen center of demands in these regions and specifically in Europe, we have focused on used cooking oil, feedstock. We have an extensive coverage of used cooking oil prices across all regions, but we have also seen growing demand for this sort of waste, renewable materials and raw materials in the European market specifically, and for all applications, actually. So, I mean, you ask who is interested in these prices. We've had uh, two main markets that have been interested in BioNafta. So this product can be used in the road transport sector as a blend stock for gasoline, and it can also be used in the petrochemical sector. I mean, we'll talk about this uh, more in detail later on, but I think it's worth noting the competition between these two sectors with the road transport sector being mandated. So you have obligations you have to meet in terms of renewable share that you have to use under European legislations, whereas the petrochemicals market is not mandated. But it's interesting that we've seen interest from from for both applications. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, Julia. And I think it's it's a very keenly watched kind of interplay between the two sectors, as you mentioned. I just want to ask you this question on how Argus prices BioNafta. Um, and if you could also share some of the price trends that you've observed since our launch in March 2022. Sure. Yeah. So the the way we price BioNafta is is really based on, on market activity. So we speak with participants in both sectors I've mentioned, so the gasoline sector and the petrochemical sector, and we collect bids, offers, trades, spreads, and all sorts of indication. We also, and, and this helps quite a bit in the coverage of Bionata, we have a, a very good view of the HVO market. We have a trading platform, Argus Open Markets, where HVO trades on a weekly basis. So every Friday, there is public bids and offers for HVO. And I mean, as I mentioned, they all come from the same sort of family of products being hydro treated products. And HVO is one of the key markets in the sense there's more production compared to BioNafta, it's more liquid. And interestingly, also HVO has both application on the road side and the chemical side. So having a very good view of the HVO market also helps with that. But primarily, you know, we uh, we are aware of the link between the two prices, but we we collect information from anyone who is involved in the in the BioNafta market and make our assessment based on on the feedback that we receive from from market participants. And in terms of price trends, I mean, as we said, we launched prices in uh, in March last year, and we've seen the highest highs and the lowest lows, I would say, in this period. So in summer of last year, we've seen record levels surpassing $3,600 on an outright basis. And then we have seen lows dip below $2,000 on an outright basis. So if you compare it to conventional NAFTA, we've seen premiums above $3,000 or not actually nearly, but yeah, around the $3,000 mark and also below $1,400. 
the reason we have seen these, these extremes are linked to, to a couple of factors. So about a year ago, we were seeing very strong competition between the chemicals market and the road transport sector. And some participants on the petrochemical space, they were paying a premium over the, the road transport sector, which is mandated. So basically, you have certain obligations to meet your targets on the road side, and that kind of sets a floor for prices. So since you're competing with a mandated market, if you want to get your hands on the product, we have seen in certain instances participants on the chemical space having to pay higher values. We have things have, have changed a little bit since then. I mean, the interest is still pretty strong, and I think we'll discuss it in more detail again. But there's also other uh, macroeconomic factors that have really impacted trade of, of some of these renewable feedstocks for polymers production. So, for example, producers, they've seen that they were struggling to pass on the cost in certain cases to end buyers or the interest is there. But then when you start talking about very high premiums, then it kind of slows down negotiations. So we have seen a bit of a decrease in demand, not because the overall interest is not there. It just kind of feels like a temporary slowdown because of the macroeconomic situation. And also in general, we've seen a decrease in prices in the biofuels complex because of a, a variety of reasons, including, again, uh, macroeconomic factors. So European markets have seen lower diesel consumption because of inflation, fears of recessions and so on. And that has translated in lower biofuels consumption. And production is growing. We've seen more imports coming in as well from, from elsewhere. And so we have had this situation in which prices were trending lower. The demand side has been yeah, not particularly strong, I would say, from, from both sectors that would be purchasing bio NAFTA. But nevertheless, we're still seeing demand for these renewable feedstocks and inquiries and uh, interest also growing from, from other regions, including the US, for example. We hear discussions for next year. We still see product flow into Asia from Europe and more producers of HVO and SAF um, that will be online in the coming months and years. So yeah, we should be seeing an increase in, uh, in availability for some of these products. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in terms of pricing going forward. Very, very interesting, Julia. And I like that you've detailed this competing uh, demand on road transportation chemicals. And you've also mentioned the recession impact as well. Sarah, uh, over to you now as our olefins and polymers expert. I'm really you know, keen to hear from you on your perspective in terms of why the pet chem sector is so invested in bio NAFTA and HVO, considering there's no obligation on mandate in place. Absolutely. It's a really interesting phenomena, isn't it? And um, I think there's a number of reasons around it. I mean, if you look at the pet chems industry and its reliance on polyethylene, polypropylene, PET as downstream products, there's really a case of sort of forward survival for them in terms of the way they market the product and, and what the brand owners are expecting uh, them to, to offer into the market. So the brand owners on a global basis want to be able to offer their, their customers uh, a green package in terms of their plastics they use. Plastics offer huge advantages into, into sort of the markets in terms of their performance and the, 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 the properties they give products, which mean that, you know, the, the storage and the safe transportation of products over over long distances but they need to be able to green those uh, green those products and reducing the 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 finding a way to reduce the carbon footprint uh, of the plastics is will support and support the growth of the industry and support in some ways its survival uh, well into the future and the benefit of bionaphtha and hvo is really the uh, complete drop in replacements for most producers so you can, without very much investment, uh, particularly if you're sort of uh, using the ISCC plus mass balance process, you can drop them into your cracker. You can use them just as you're using normal NAFTA or 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 or, or different um, feedstocks into the crackers uh, without doing anything at all. And then you can market green product to to to, to your customers. And it's really interesting in that the you know the customers, uh, the, the producers out there have major targets in terms of what they want to be able to offer offer their customers over the next uh, five to ten years. So, looking at the the people who have really announced targets, there's something like 17 million tons 
of commitment out there in terms of the industry about uh, offering these products to the market. The, the, the problem comes, and Julia really, know, you know, sort of um, uh, highlighted this, is one of price. So how affordable is the are these products into the market? And certainly over the last couple of years with such you know, with higher inflation, with consumers really tightening their belts and spend and wanting to spend less, the demand for these green products, because they're more expensive, has been much reduced. And there's a feeling, I think, that, you know, we need to be able to, A, uh, have some political will behind uh, the, the growth of these products, but also some, you know, customers need to be able to afford them in, in their normal shopping basket. I mean, if you're looking at other issues for the chemical industry, so, you know, you've got HVO and Bionatha as one stream they can use to green their products. Uh, they're also looking at using more mechanically recycled products. So that is product that's been collected, chipped and is reused and then added into the streams, potentially as a, a combination of uh, virgin plastic and, and, and final plastic. There's new routes using something like ethanol. Certainly in the European market, there's a new investment out there going from green ethanol to in, into ethylene. That's something that we've also seen quite widely in, in South America in, in their investments. And there's also the, the, the route that would use waste plastic, recycle it into something called pyrolysis oil, which is basically an oil equivalent, and then recycle that around the cracking loop. Um, but all of these have their problems. All of them have a more expensive than conventional routes. And at the end of the day, all of them produce waste. So plastic waste has become a real reputational issue for the chemical industry. And they're trying very hard and making lots of investments uh, downstream into recyclers and waste collectors and sorters to to help solve uh, that problem, which is it is part of the wider uh, plastics uh, recycling industry. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's very useful. And just to tie it back to what Julia mentioned earlier, what is your outlook on bio nafta demand in the petrochemical sector more specifically? It would grow if it's affordable. It will definitely grow. The issue is affordability. Those premiums that Julia was talking about, sort of, I think it maxed out at over 3,000. And the premium, something like at the moment, uh, over 1,000, makes it much more expensive as a product. And that's not affordable for everybody. So there's there's a lots of potential for growth if it becomes affordable. And I think the European industry is tending to lead the way on this, but it's also a global phenomena. So there is an element of if they if Europe's going to invest in these new routes and, and spend the money and have the more expensive plastics available to the market, then maybe um, the governments need to step up and, and protect the industry from imports which are coming from other regions at, at lower prices. So, yeah, lots of lots of issues to tackle. Sarah, Julia, um, really, thank you very much. Uh, your insights are all very excellent and I've learned a lot today. I wish we can go on, but due to time constraints, we have to draw to a close now. It's been a pleasure talking to you both and thank you to everyone for listening. This has been a special edition podcast of Chemical Conversations. For more information on Argus, please visit argusmedia.com. Mm-hmm.